Well, praise the Lord. Welcome to day three, one of the most incredible revelations. Don Mandel is in the house. Don, Brother Cirillo did an entire school of ministry on Discover Your Ministry, but this manifested Sons of God is a revelation on discovering your identity. Yeah, it's a springboard into a revelation, which I just, it was my first Morris Cirillo meeting, July of 1986, uh, when God sent me there and to see fresh revelation come out of him. Actually, he had told everyone he was gonna be on the strategies of Jesus. And then this all uh, emerged and came forth of the manifested sons of God. And I just wanna commend the people that are participating. I won't call them viewers because they're dynamically involved in the school of ministry, but you're doing what Jairus did, you know, Jairus, had all these distractions. He had religious leaders that didn't want him to seek out Jesus. Why aren't you with your daughter? Uh, he Even the people mocked him as he brought Jesus. And I know that many of you, you may be having to put aside to prioritize, to stay faithful to this school, but God has something tremendous for you. I can tell you because I was there and uh, also the previous sessions with Greg and Mark that you've had. You know, so Don, today's message, I am super excited. Everything changes when you discover who you really are. I want you to know the greatest battle over our life is the battle for who God says we really are. That's why when Satan came to Jesus to tempt him, his first words were, if you are. And I want you to know something, yesterday's message, what an incredible encouragement to know that we do not have to prove anything. Jesus didn't fall into the trap of trying to prove to the devil who he really was. He knew who he really was. And because of this school of ministry, you and I are coming into an understanding, a revelation, an impartation of who God says you and I really are. So if you are ready, I tell you what, everything changes when you discover who you really are. Welcome once again, God's servant, day three, manifested sons of God, Dr. Morris Cirillo. Somebody said to me, they said, Brother Cirillo, well, it's easy for you to talk like that. You're up there in the glory all the time. Now, I'm just going to fool you again. You think I'm going to come out here and I'm going to whimper and whine and tell you how I go through battles too? Well, you're mistaken, brother. The first thing you said was right. I am in the glory all the time, and it is easy. And when you get in the glory, it'll be easy. It's only hard when you're trying in your own self. And when you haven't got the breakthrough, and when you haven't got the revelation, and when you don't have the knowledge, and when you don't have the understanding, and when you're in darkness, oh yes, that's hard. Somebody said, Brother Shalom, how do you deal with all these people who criticize you? I didn't know anybody's criticizing me. <laughs> Somebody said, don't you know you got enemies? I didn't know I have any enemies. I'm just living, bless God, like everybody loves me. You know what the secret of harvest is? It's knowing how to deal with the negative forces of unbelief. You gotta know how to deal with them. I know one thing, they're not gonna put this little Jew preacher on the defensive, no way. I'm on the offensive. You say, well, how do you deal with them, Brother Shalom? I deal with them like Jesus did, I ignore them. You'll never hear me get up in the pulpit and waste one second of God's time criticizing any of my so-called enemies. Let them alone, God will deal with 
Kingdom. Don't have time. I've got too much time killing the devil, slugging it out, kicking him here, chopping him there. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Glory to God. You know, that's what Jesus did. That's how he handled the negative forces. When they criticized him, he tried his best. Never defended himself. Tried his best to just, you know, make believe they weren't even saying anything. It was only until they pressed him that he even would respond. It's like when he walked into Jairus' house. You remember the ruler of the synagogue whose daughter had died? You remember that story in the Bible? Jesus got to Jairus' house late. Jairus came to meet him. Jairus met Jesus on that street corner, right in that experience. But because Jesus stopped with the woman with the issue of blood, he got to Jairus' house late and the daughter was already dead. <laughs> what a sight. First thing he did when he came through the courtyard of this rich man's house, because Jairus was a wealthy man. Soon as he got into the courtyard, he was met by all these religious leaders. <laughs> they was all crying because Jairus' daughter was dead, but when they saw Jairus walk in, brother, they shut off every tear, and they looked at him like, Argh. You know why? Because Jairus is walking hand in hand with Jesus. And those religious leaders looked at him and they said to him, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Think about it. Think about it. You are a ruler of the synagogue. You're a big man. Think about it. Think about it. While you went out chasing this healer, your daughter died. How are you going to live that down? What are you going to say to all the other religious leaders now? Your daughter's dead. What are you going to do? Jairus was stunned. He looked at Jesus. It's not recorded, but I'm sure he must have said something like, What are we going to do, Jesus? Is it strange you don't find a word of dialogue between Jesus and these religious leaders? Not a word of dialogue. He never stopped to defend what happened. He never tried to justify the fact that he got there late. In their eyes. You know what he did? He just made believe and never even heard him. He turned his back on them. He put his hand in Jairus' hand and he whispered over his shoulder. He said, Jairus, remember what I told you back there? I said, I'll come and heal her. Let's go upstairs. <laughs> Amen! And you know the story. You know how he raised this girl, how her spirit came back into her body. After she had been dead. You say, what are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to tell you this. It's not necessary for you to defend who you are. You're a son of the living God. Act like it. Not necessary. Turn your back on every unbelief and just keep getting the job done. Just keep healing the sick. Just keep delivering the oppressed. Just keep saving the lost and let the work speak for itself. God planned for you on this earth. It was part of his plan on this earth not in heaven for you to be remember we talked about yesterday how jesus was the express 
image of Christ. Uh, the express, excuse me, the express how Christ was the express image of God. We talked about how that the glory of God shone through him. And we translated that word glory from the Greek, doxa, which means all that God was and all that God is and all that God has. All that God is and all that he was and all that he has, the glory, that's what it means. All that God has, doxa, D-O-X-A. All that God is and all that God has. All that God was from the beginning of time. That glory was manifested in Christ. And it's God's will that you and I, as Jesus, was the expressed image of God, it is God's will that you and I also be the express image as Jesus was of God. It is God's will that you and I be the express image of Jesus. Now, how does this manifestation take place? Jesus was the Son of God. And God put his image in him. Remember what we said yesterday? From the beginning of time, God's purpose was to have children. Did you get that? I'm gonna, I don't know when I feel it go into your spirit. Did you get that? God's will, his whole purpose, that's why he created Adam and Eve and told him to multiply, was to have children. Now, Jesus was the express image, not in his physical body, because that was a house of muscle and bone, but inside him. You remember we went up to the transfiguration? We're going to go back there in just a few minutes. And what shone through his body became transparent. And they were able to see what was deposited in that body of Jesus, the glory of God. Now, not tomorrow, the devil's a liar. Not next week. Not next year. Not when you get to heaven. Jesus is the Son of God now. And he is the express image of the Father. And my dear beloved, you and I are the sons of God. You and I are with Christ having been made, having been begotten, he became the first son. And because he became the first son, he then was able to make us sons because he begot us through his gospel. And he is the express image of the father. And now we are sons with him, but in the literal sense, we are his sons, for we have been begotten by him. And now it is written in 1 John 3, 2, not tomorrow, not next week, but now are we the sons of God. When now you say, Brother Shula, I don't understand what you just said, then let's read Romans 8 29 and let's give the devil another cuff on the side. 
Romans 8, 29. You're not going to like this because too many of you Pentecostal people don't understand these things. You missed a good place to say ouch. Romans 8, 29. Look at it. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. That, that's the area we have the problem with, but I'm going to leave that alone because we are, are predestined. Whether you believe it or not, you don't have to believe it. You'll find out someday you are. Don't have to worry about it. You'll find out. Say, how can I be predestined? That takes away my free moral will. No, it doesn't. On the basis of God's foreknowledge that he knows all things, he predestines things into existence. Simple. All right, Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestine. To what? To be conformed to the image of his son that he who Jesus might be the first born among many brethren look what happened my brother look what happened my sister when the first Adam disobeyed God and sin came into the world. It was like God starting all over again. Because everybody born from Adam and Eve on that, from that point on was born and shaped in iniquity and born and shaped in sin. But now here comes another Adam. Breathe just like the first Adam was breathed. And this Adam lives in this world as God expected the first Adam to live. He lives without sin. He lives able to confront the devil. He lives able to defeat him. He lives able to overcome him. He is tempted at every point like as we are. And he's yet without sin. And because of this my brother he becomes the firstborn of many brethren he becomes the one who gives birth to a new way a new life a new ability for new creatures in God through Christ Jesus oh hallelujah Say it with me this morning. I, I am, am a part, a part of, God's of God's end time plan. End time plan. Now, what the devil doesn't want you to know is this. That you can walk among men on this earth as a son. Begotten like Jesus. Jesus came to reveal, to show us what it would be like to live a God life. Did you put that in your spirit? He was the express image of God. Think of what would happen if when Satan looked at us, he wouldn't see this house of muscle and bone. He wouldn't see this little Jew preacher. But think of what would happen to the devil. If he saw, when he looked at Mars, Jesus. Yeah. 
2,000 years ago, this church was born. But it was born a baby. It was born a baby, Pastor. A baby. A baby. How many mothers and fathers are here? Let me see your hands. When you had your little daughter or son or whoever it was that you had, boy or girl, you brought it home. Did you take one arm, mom and papa take it and march it out of the hospital? Did you do that? Why not? Why not, dear? You with your finger like this, why not? Pardon? It was a baby, say it. See, the devil wants to get you all choked up down there. He'd like you just sit there and not able to speak or respond. That's the devil's task. You know how he deals with it? He says, well, you're different. He says, I'm different. He says, I'm conservative. God doesn't have any conservatives. He doesn't have any liberals. He just has children. You don't do that to a baby. When you get your child at home, that newborn infant, four or five days old, just take it out of the hospital. Do you put it in a chair and shove it up against the kitchen table and say, okay, Junior, wait a minute now. Mom and I are going to make a steak and celebrate you're here and start feeding a T-bone steak? Come on, do you do that? Why don't you? Why don't you? Say it. It's a baby. What do you give baby? That's right. Milk. And it has to suck it. Now you can look back all you want to. But I'm here to tell you as God's prophet. Thank God. God for everything he ever did in the Old Testament. Thank God for everything he ever did in the New Testament. Thank God for the birth of the church 2,000 years ago. But I'm here to tell you, stop looking back. Yeah. Ephesians 1, 9. All right, let's read. Yeah, let's read 9. Ephesians 1 9, it's actually the 10th verse that I want to get to. Ephesians 1 9. Now you're reading it, and I don't know what translation, King James, but I'm going to read to you just a little bit different from an original, uh, uh, another text that gives you uh, a much more amplified meaning. Listen to it. Ephesians 1 9. Making known to us the mystery of his will, of his plan, and of his purpose. And it is this, in accordance with his good pleasure. Remember, I talked about this yesterday, which he previously purposed and set forth in him. He planned for the maturity of the times and the climax of the ages. Now, what time is it? What time of harvest is it? It's God's end time, harvest time. And put this in your spirit. Harvest time is the greatest period of maturity when you put the 
seed in the ground, that's not the time of maturity. That's like a newborn baby. When it sprouts up, that's not the time of maturity. But when that stalk of corn grows and the ear pops out and it gets ripened and gets golden and it has matured to where you are what? Listen to this now. Able to partake. It isn't until the times of God, his end time, that God has been able to mature his people. We've had 2,000 years of growing up. We've had 2,000 years of getting right. We've had 2,000 years of maturing and coming to the golden harvest. Now the trumpet of God is ready to sound and Jesus is going to come and he's coming for a people that are going to be a bride that's going to be fit to adorn Jesus. Sent to his son a church without spot, without wrinkle, full of the power and the glory and the life that Jesus died and gave himself for. Well, somebody that believes Jesus is coming, I want you to declare you and I are a part of God's end time plan. Don Mandel, what an incredible day three. Everything changes when we discover who God says we really are. Yes, uh, just as you said, Greg, the discovering beyond discover your ministry, what you've said is discover who we really are and Dr. Cirillo is inviting us to take our place in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And of course, we know from Luke 7, 28 that the least in the kingdom of God is greater even than John the Baptist. Hebrews 11, 13, after hearing all the great people of the Bible, they died in faith, not having received the promise, but seen it afar off. But that isn't you. This promise is now tangible. It's manifested in your life. And right in this same meeting where Brother Srilla was preaching and ministering, he couldn't hold back the manifestation and people rushed to the platform. And it wasn't so much the classic repentance, I'm sorry for my sin. It was now that I'm this manifested son, these other things don't have any part of my life. As you can see in this picture, they're throwing their non-prescription medication, that is dope. They're throwing their cigarettes. Pastors are getting up and confessing their immorality because it isn't worth it because this new creation manifested in your life through this manifestation takes you into a completely different realm. And I believe anything that is marring or hindering any little foxes that are trying to spoil the vine right now, they're being dealt with and expelled through the revelation from God's servant. And I tell you what, Don, there is such a powerful anointing upon this school of ministry, upon this message. What we have said so many times is that when Brother Srilo is under that anointing, releasing the revelation from God. It is a revelation that takes pressure off of your life. It has an incredible two-edged sword because on one hand, it's raising you to a level that you have never been before, raising you to see yourself the way you maybe have never seen yourself before, but then reminding you that God isn't depending on you to get from here to hear, but God is depending on what you and I will let him make of us. And as Brother Don shared, what a privilege it was for us all these years to be in these meetings. This anointing was originally poured out and I just believe that there is a new generation, there is a new breed of God's people that are being raised up through Facebook, YouTube, the podcast, however you're receiving this school of ministry, you're not watching by accident. Tomorrow is going to be 
prime beef. Tomorrow is going to be prime ribeye steak. You talk about meat. The Apostle Paul said, we're not children, we're not babies, we're not going for the milk, we're not going for the pablum. But tomorrow, Brother Thrill is going to take us, and you be ready. It is going to be the signature message of this entire school of ministry as Dr. Morris Rillo takes us into the book of Romans, chapter 8, begins to show us what we are predestined for. Predestination is a predetermined course of action. We are under destiny, and it is God that is working in us. I want to encourage you, don't miss tomorrow. Incredible day four, and then day five will be our final day. This will be a shorter school of ministry, but I tell you what, God is packing revelation. Day five, wow, Brother Srilo talks about the seed of God in us. And I love the statement that he makes. The seed of God in you can not fail. So Father, we thank you today for your precious viewers. As Don said, they're not just viewers and listeners, but they are participators even as we are. And so Lord, we thank you that you are taking us from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit dwells in our earthen vessels. God, the treasure of your anointing, the treasure of who you say that we really are, the treasure of your word, the treasure of your presence. All we can say is God, receive all the praise and the honor and the glory. Yours is the kingdom and the power and all the glory belongs to Jesus. And everybody said, amen and amen. Make your appointment. Don't miss next time. Make sure if you haven't got it yet, there are tremendous spiritual resources that I believe will supplement this message. The Bible says the word of God is like a seed, and then there's water, and then there's light, and then there's growth, then there's breakthrough. Passing on the mantle, the battle is not yours, but God's breaking through stress and spiritual burnout. You see all the books, all the materials, use the phone number, use the link on behalf of Don, on behalf of our incredible first lady, Teresa Cirillo, David Cirillo, our president, our entire team here at Legacy that can't wait to welcome you to the campus in Jesus name. This is Greg Morrow reminding you once again, you are a part of God's end time plan. And I tell you what, you are doing the right thing, staying connected to this school of ministry you're discovering that God has not planned any defeats for you. We can't wait to see you tomorrow. Bring somebody along to watch with you. We'll see you live from Legacy in Jesus' name.